Well, let's make a start. I bid you a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, whether you might be in the Czech Republic or in the UK, it is a particular pleasure to welcome as my distinguished guest, Neil Metcalf, the chorus master of the uh, Edinburgh University Music Society Chorus, but as we shall find out later this evening, much else besides. Um, as this evening we are joined by friends in Scotland and elsewhere, I should like very briefly uh, to say a couple of words about this series of motivational Zoom sessions on repertoire and interpretation. Um, I started doing these last semester during lockdown in Prague. Um, the idea was that we needed to find some means of keeping in touch with each other and with our chorus, the Charles University Chorus in my case, and the Charles University Orchestra, both of which I conduct. And um, given that we could not, due to those circumstances outside our control, uh, we could not meet physically to make music together, which is what we would have liked to do best, of course. We should find other ways of compensating, at least partially, and trying to turn this severe disadvantage into a sort of creative advantage. And so each week I would talk about one of the pieces that we were working on with the chorus and with the orchestra, um, uh, looking at what the composer was trying to do, looking at the texts in question, uh, looking at the composer's correspondence, seeing what else other people were composing at the time, and so on and so forth. The sort of thing that one could not possibly get away with if one had in front of one uh, 80 eager players holding their instruments or uh, singers eager to get on with singing and learning the music. Um, we had hoped that this semester we would be able to make music normally, but alas, circumstances uh, proved otherwise. And so we decided to start those sessions again, but this time we agreed that we should not limit ourselves, particularly to repertoire that we ourselves were uh, working on. And uh, we should open our doors to friends uh, and colleagues from sister organizations, choruses and orchestras uh, in other places with whom we might have some uh, links of uh, friendship, uh, and open our doors wide open. And it occurred to me that one excellent way of doing this, uh, as well as to give more luster to those weekly sessions, would be to try and invite distinguished and charismatic colleagues whom I have the good fortune of knowing uh, in different places. And the first of these is in fact none other than Neil. So a very warm welcome to Neil Metcalf uh, from us all. Delighted that you're able to join us, uh, Neil. Thank, um, you very much. Thank you. Now, I should like briefly to explain how it is that I have had the good fortune of uh, of knowing Neil um, at all. Uh, for family reasons, over the last couple of years, I've had occasion to visit Edinburgh uh, quite frequently. And I was told uh, that I should perhaps come to a rehearsal of the chorus that I might enjoy it because they are very exciting and inspiring. And I found that that was indeed the case, so much so that I would try and as much as possible arrange for my visits to Edinburgh to coincide with concerts that the uh, Edinburgh University Musical Chorus was giving at the time. So I should like to do a bit of showing off now and show you how many of those events I've had the uh, good fortune of being able to attend uh, in, in this period. Uh, let me first of all say that the University of Edinburgh Chorus under Neil's direction is not just an ordinary university uh, institution. Um, I tried counting the numbers of the members from one of the concert programs that I had. Um, this was, I think, from the 150th anniversary celebrations. And when I reached the number 200, I just gave up. So it's a 200-strong university chorus 
which I think is extremely unusual for any university chorus um, on the continent of Europe or elsewhere in the UK. But that's not the only remarkable thing about it. The remarkable thing is the sheer quality of it that is allied to the quantity of members. And this chorus, if I understand correctly, and I, I trust Neil will correct me if I'm wrong, but you admit people without auditioning them. Uh, yes. nonetheless, nonetheless, it is a chorus of enviable standard and they've done a lot of uh, challenging things extremely well. And so that's, that's very impressive indeed. Um, the very first concert that I was able to attend was uh, almost exactly three years ago now. The University Musical Society had been founded 150 years ago, so that's another thing to uh, you know, take notice of. And uh, amongst other things, the program included, in fact, that was the grand finale, the main item in the program, was a particularly exciting performance of Orff's Carmina Burana. And I managed to sneak into a couple of rehearsals before. This was at the Reed Hall, which was a place that, to my mind, has a lot of associations because, like so many generations of music students, uh, uh, most of us have read the essays in musical analysis by uh, Tovey. And Tovey instituted, in, instituted a series of concerts in this very hall, if I'm not mistaken. So there's history dripping in every corner. And uh, I took the liberty of taking a couple of photographs. Um, I hope I don't get into trouble for having done that. Uh, I even uh, made a very small clip uh, of the rehearsal that I shall take the liberty of playing for the benefit of members of the Charles University Orchestra and Chorus who were not there and did not have the opportunity to see what it was like. quite electrifying. Um, I shall just admit a couple of people in the waiting room. Excellent. Um, I also had the pleasure of attending a purely choral rehearsal the next day. I think it's St. Leonard's Hall. I, uh, I took this as a sort of panoramic, uh, panoramic photo on my iPad. You can see how large the chorus is, but the sound that you could hear, even with my very imperfect uh, recording, uh, is really rather uh, thrilling. And imagine this is a voluntary chorus of people who don't get paid uh, to sing, and they're not auditioned, they're not specially selected. Uh, and to whip up the chorus into this sort of standard is really uh, something rather admirable. And I was extremely impressed, and it was a very great pleasure to, uh, to witness it. It was a joy to behold. And uh, the other event that followed on the next occasion when I was in Edinburgh, I think this was Greyfriars Kirk. I hope I didn't get these names uh, wrong. This was a magical performance of Haydn's The Creation. And it was very special for all sorts of reasons. There was no orchestra. Everything was accompanied by a colleague at the organ and Neil himself at the piano. Together they uh, improvised or worked out um, an accompaniment that actually substituted the orchestra. And the other remarkable thing was that all these solos were sung by members of the choir who had been coached by Neil himself. And in the best possible sense of the word, this gave it a sort of chamber music-like, almost Again, I stress in the best sense, a sort of salon music-like intimacy. 
which was very, very precious. And I got a lot out of uh, the occasion. I enjoyed it uh, tremendously. Of course, the large scale grandeur and the power were not at all lacking in the choral movements. Uh, but it was a very special occasion, uh, quite an unusual way of performing the creation, and one that revealed a lot that is uh, in the score. Uh, I enjoyed every moment. The next event I had the privilege of attending in the spectacular St. Mary's Church in Edinburgh was the Dvorak Sabat Mater. It is a work that I myself have performed quite a few times, uh, not least with the Charles University Chorus and Orchestra, amongst others. And that was special also, and I was lucky to be there. You can see this is a very beautiful church, but uh, the chorus being so large, it filled most of the space uh, available, and it sounded extremely exciting under these vaults, under the uh, the domes of, of this uh, splendid building. Um, then uh, there was yet a more grand uh, concert that I was uh, privileged enough to attend. That was in the splendid Bakuan Hall that I hadn't been to before. It was a program that consisted in the first half of the chorus performing on its own. There were some superb Bruckner motets uh, and one or two other pieces, one with organ accompaniment, I think. I don't have the program here with me, so I'm not quite sure what the program was. And then the chorus, together with the orchestra of uh, the Edinburgh University Musical Society, tackled one of the pinnacles of the repertoire, namely Mahler's Second Symphony, of which, as many of you will know from the very first session that we had this semester, which was devoted to Mahler's Tenth Symphonies, uh, employs a soprano and alto soloist and a large chorus. And uh, again, it was extremely exciting to be there. This is what the hall looked like before the performers, uh, the performers took their places. And uh, that's a poster that I was able to photograph or, or a program, perhaps the front cover of the program. And in the first half, you can see the chorus sounding absolutely superb in this round uh, or perhaps horseshoe shaped, I'm not quite sure now, space. And uh, the Mahler was the final item in the uh, program. And I'm afraid my piracy knew no bounds. So I took the liberty of uh, recording a few seconds uh, rather discreetly from where I was uh, seated. Happily, I wasn't apprehended. And you can just see how it sounded. <laughs> So it was a profoundly moving uh, occasion. And again, it was sheer good fortune that I was able to arrange to be in Edinburgh when this, uh, this uh, happened. I must find a way of moving to the slide. Ah, yes. Then there was a remarkable performance of the Brahms German Requiem, uh, which again, we have performed in Prague together with our friends in Cologne and on our own on a number of occasions. Uh, this time the accompanists were two very fine pianists and again there was very great clarity and transparency in the, in the uh, textures and it was a thoroughly enjoyable uh, occasion, a 
very lovely flowing performance of the uh, German Requiem uh, in the Greyfriars Kirk. And my story ends slightly sadly in that uh, I happened to be in Edinburgh uh, in February um, earlier this year, and I had the privilege of attending a rehearsal of the Bruckner Tedem, as well as a Wesley anthem, Blessed Be God the Father, in which I had myself uh, sung as an undergraduate many years ago, and which I had conducted also many, many moons ago, and it brought back memories. And it was all sounding uh, uh, really rather lovely, but this was just before lockdown. And the concert for this event was sadly cancelled due to the pandemic and the associated circumstances that we are all um, all too familiar with. So this is a little uh, prelude to say what my own personal uh, uh, association, if, if we could go as far as to call it, call it that, or my own personal experiences uh, as someone who appreciates uh, this uh, work uh, very much indeed. So I shall now stop sharing my screen and uh, uh, introduce uh, Neil. Uh, now, obviously, uh, inevitably, because I have been exposed only to one particular aspect of Neil's work, which is the work he has been doing with the Edinburgh University Chorus, I, I'm not qualified to comment on the very many other excellent things that he's been doing. Before I invite him to tell us about those other things, I have a first question uh, to ask him. Uh, Neil, um, both from the manner in which you were accompanying the singers at the piano at those various performances, and also from the way in which you use your own voice in uh, demonstrating and helping your choral singers with their technique, one thing that is very, very palpable is that you have a profound understanding and affection for the human voice. Although I don't think that you earn your living by singing, so I should like to ask, you, you must have had a background as a singer. Were you a choir boy, perchance? Or can you tell yeah. us what, what that came from? Um, I suppose, yes. I, um, I started um, as a youngster, um, as a church chorister, um, and sang for many years. And um, through that also took up the organ and was encouraged to play the piano. So a lot of what I've done has come through from being a, a chorister. Um, continue to sing at university but I was really a pianist and organist and continuo player and then after university um, did a postgraduate um, course at what's now the Royal Scottish Conservatoire, Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, um, in the opera school as a repetitor um, and then after a year or so there worked at Scottish Opera on the music staff um, and really began my career as a repetitor um, playing for rehearsals, coaching singers, um, doing a bit of offstage conducting, playing a bit of continuo, um, as we call it in the UK, a jack of all trades really, doing a lot of things to do with singing um, and that's always stayed with me. So I suppose, you know, I was an amateur singer really, but uh, yes I do have a great affection for the voice and um, by complete accident working with the voice has stayed with me throughout my career. Um, an opera, musical theatre, the chorus, all sorts, really. It must be a tremendous asset also with your work with opera singers. But uh, I should like to rewind a little bit, if I may, because I you, you sound eminently English to me, not Scottish when you speak. So what drew you to the beautiful city of Edinburgh in the first place? Well, yes, I grew up in Yorkshire in um, England and um, it was, I think when I came to university in, in the sort of mid 1980s, it felt quite exotic to go to a university that was outside of England. Um, and I'd been to Edinburgh, obviously, um, to the festival and the fringe a few times in my teenage years um, and loved the city. It's a bit like Prague, it, uh, very similar cities in a way, I think. Um, I don't know if you have that experience. Um, and um, yeah, I just love the city and it had a great music course. Um, lots of music going on in the city, like Prague, and um, I was really drawn to it, um, particularly uh, the professor at the time, Kenneth Layton, um, very renowned British composer at the time, um, was in charge of the department, 
and um, I was keen to um, you know learn what I could from him um, as well whilst I was here so he was a big influence as well yeah and what did your work as an organ scholar entail at the university um, well, um, Greyfriars Kirk, as we call it, the church, Greyfriars Kirk, um, is the university parish church. You put a photograph of it up earlier. It's where we have most of our concerts with the musical society. And um, a marvellous chap called, um, oh, I forget his name now. He was the organist there, and he set up um, a group called the um, Scottish Baroque Ensemble, which was one of the first Baroque groups I think the first Baroque group in Scotland, professional Baroque group. Um, and he got Michael Chibbert, Michael Chibbert is his name. And he got so overwhelmed with running the Baroque ensemble, um, he wanted to take on an assistant at Greyfriars. So I became their organ scholar, um, which was quite frightening at first, but um, I got used to it quite quickly. And um, I've been a chorister myself, so I knew a lot of the repertoire. And um, yeah, uh, but it wasn't the organ that you saw on the picture um, earlier. Um, during my time there, they'd saved money to buy a new organ and have it oh. built um, as a sort of replica Baroque, early Romantic instrument. Um, there's about eight or nine of them in Edinburgh. There, there was a big building spree of organs in Edinburgh in the late oh. early 90s. Um, so yeah, that explains the organ thing and Greyfriars really. And I believe that the chorus at the university that you now conduct, uh, you were at one stage a member of it yourself as a student, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, 1984 to 1988, yes. Um, I was a second tenor in the chorus. And also I, I played for the rehearsals as well a lot. I, I learnt my craft really as a repetitor later on, playing for lots of rehearsals for an amazing conductor, Christopher Bell, who I'll maybe mention later, who has now started the National Youth Choir of Scotland, and that's done great things in Scotland. But I learned a lot from him and um, was president of the Musical Society for a year as well. Um, yes, and then left and did other things and never ever thought that I would come back. But for the last 10 or 11 years, um, it's been my joy and privilege to to work with the chorus again. So it's a, it's a lovely, lovely thing. Marvellous. And what is your secret? How is it that you've been able to attract uh, 200 singers to a chorus when most of us in other cities in Europe and other universities um, would be grateful for a fraction of, 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 of those uh, singers? I mean, part of the answer is that uh, these uh, rehearsals of yours are full of positive energy and not a moment is wasted and uh, one feels galvanized and electrified and so on and so forth. Uh, but how is it that you're able to attract so many singers in the first place? Um, was it always a large chorus? Uh, in my university days myself, I remember it being a large chorus, yes. Um, and then of course I, I left Edinburgh and went to work at the opera. So I was away for a good 10, 15 years. Uh, but um, yes, it seems to have grown. I think in the UK, there's a particularly, um, there's a big thirst for amateur music making. That's a very particular um, British thing, I think. I mean, a lot of people sing, a lot of people have come up through choirs at home. And it's a, um, I also think, especially in Scotland, a lot of people prefer to make music rather than go see it being made. So you often find that the, the, the number of people on stage, especially at an amateur performance, is bigger than the number of people in the audience, because most people enjoy performing. They've grown up with that in their, in their family. Um, so I think we benefit from that. And also the big thing, of course, I think that it is non-auditioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, um, we welcome anyone. And um, at, that's actually been quite a good, um, a good thing, I think, because um, it kind of polices itself, if you understand, that um, I'd always say in rehearsals, you needn't necessarily learn the whole piece. You needn't necessarily learn the most tricky bits as long as you enjoy making the music each week and you sing in the concert and you enjoy singing the bits you can sing, no one knows if you're not singing some of the other bits that are too tricky. So if you can't make every rehearsal, if you can't manage to get up to the top of the soprano line or whatever it is, um, I think it's important that people ha m make music together as a non-competitive sport, I suppose. Th there is room for both, but um, I think at university, um, it's a nice thing that people who aren't musicians, um, most of our members are not 
doing music, uh, hardly any. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I think it's lovely that people can um, bring what skill they have from home. A lot of people um, stay on after university. It's, it's, it's more of a community chorus, really, um, with a big um, group of people at the university. But there are lecturers, there are retired people, there are people who have nothing to do with the university and just live in the town. Um, it, it's, it's an amazing creature. It's an amazing creature, but it is well groomed and kept in fine shape. Uh, that doesn't happen on its own. Uh, and particularly, it is very admirable that the standard is so very, uh, so very high in the face of the fact that any person off the street could could literally walk in and 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 acquire uh, membership. Well. Uh, should we now uh, uh, perhaps look at one or two of the musical uh, musical illustrations that uh, you have prepared for us? You mentioned uh, Kenneth Leighton. Kenneth Leighton. 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 Yes, it's a name I have seen more than I have heard during uh, my time as an undergraduate. Service sheets because he has a Magnificat and Nunc Dimittis, or perhaps more than one. Um, uh, do you? Tell us a little about him and about the piece that you would uh, like us to uh, share with you, or you would like to share with us. Right? Yes, um, so uh, a Yorkshireman, Kenneth Layton as well, he was a chorister at um, Wakefield Cathedral, not far from where I grew up, um, and then read music and classics at Oxford. I think he got a double first, a really clever man. Um, he studied composition with Dalla Piccola, I think, in Italy for a while. Uh -huh. But he came from that background of he was a chorister, he was a good pianist. Um, you know, he wrote in a very, I suppose what you might say is an old fashioned style. He knew counterpoint inside out. He knew all the classics. Um, he always used to say when he was composing, he rather liked, he was a very humble man. But he, he, I remember him saying once, um, he admired Brahms greatly because Brahms never did any crossings out. Brahms just wrote what was in his head and it's how he tried to write when he wrote and um, he was amazing at um, disseminating um, counterpoint and how to write contrapuntally and how to write harmonically a really a real inspiration it, it's unfortunate that he um, he actually died at the end of my last year at Edinburgh but um, I feel blessed to have had um, you know that time that time with him so i've got here this may be very boring for your um watchers and listeners because i don't have um, a fabulous powerpoint presentation like you but um i've got some um some music here to play i don't think it's worth sharing my screen for this because it's just on um spotify this right. is luli lula thou little tiny child it's a carol that leighton wrote um it became very popular here when i was a child um it's one of his most popular pieces very beautiful, very simple, um, and I think, have you not sung it yourselves? Uh, I, I strongly suspect that we, we did it three or four years ago. Um, and it was brought by a member of ours from the UK. Uh, once a year, e each December, we have a number of Christmas concerts, that's a tradition, but one of them uh, happens to be in the hall where we usually rehearse, because it's part of a hospital, the hall where we rehearse. And it's our... Um, uh, opportunity for thanking the hospital um, for allowing us to rehearse there and so doctors, nurses, even patients as well as friends of performers are welcome to attend and one uh, traditional thing is that um, our chorus also having various members from all over the place, all over Europe and other countries as well, I encourage people to bring carols from wherever they come. One year we even sang a Japanese carol um, we've sung carols in Finnish and all sorts of outlandish uh, languages, well, from our point of view, outlandish. Um, and uh, a girl from England brought us this carol. We had done a different Luli Lula, a sort of traditional medieval sounding melody, but I, I strongly suspect that the one that uh, your teacher and mentor composed is, is the one that we sang, but uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so if you will play it, uh, we, we will immediately, some people will gasp with recognition, uh, I hope. Uh, oh, yeah. So, great looking forward to hearing it. I think I need to mute myself at this end and then play it, so uh, do let me know if you can't hear it out here. Okay, go. okay.
Um, I cannot hear anything as yet. It may well be that sharing your screen uh, might be a necessary condition for the music from your computer to be uh, to to sound. I'm afraid. Let's do that. Sorry about that. That's all right. I will share now. Am I sharing? I think I am. Yes. Here we go then. Uh, let's try this. Pause. Lovely, marvelous, marvelous. Um, did you mention that another um, uh, disciple or uh, another person inspired by uh, Lighton was the composer James Macmillan? That's right, yes. Um, so James Macmillan, um, you, your listeners may not know, a very well-known Scottish, British composer now, I would say, um, very well published. Um, he did his undergraduate degree at Edinburgh. Um, I think he graduated two or three years before me. Um, he's from Glasgow originally. And um, he has written a lot of choral music, um, a great writer of choral music. Um, and Leighton taught him. Um, yes, that was a very long-winded answer. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to lead on to, the, uh, uh, to another one of your musical uh, choices. Uh, I think there's quite a, quite an important story behind it. Um, uh, Cantos Sagrados, I believe. That's right, yes. Now, um, 
Yes, so this is a very, uh, I suppose it's quite politically motivated in some ways, James Macmillan. Um, and the reason why he's become quite popular, I mean, he speaks to the common man, I suppose, and his music's very accessible for amateur choirs. It, um, you'll understand what I mean. It, it's just difficult enough to be quite tricky for four or five rehearsals to get, as we'd say here, to get your teeth into. Um, and um, the results are amazing. So um, this is a piece um, which is concerned with political repression in Latin America. It's beautifully written and beautifully scored um, for chorus and orchestra. It's in three, I suppose, movements or scenes. Um, in the third movement, um, it's talking about a political prisoner who's been, um, who's about to be shot and he's, um, his executioner begs him for forgiveness. There's a kind of, wow. um, and um, his his handling of the material is quite outstanding. I'm slightly panicking as I'm talking to you because I can't remember where I've saved the sound file. I have it's on here somewhere. So I will chat away about well, it. Uh, yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, it was about Luli Lula. Uh, the text of it is also rather remarkable because. It is a Christmas carol, at the same time it's a lullaby, but as the words make clear, if one imagines the Virgin Mary holding baby Jesus in her arms and lulling him to sleep, it's as if she's able to foresee what's going to happen and she's acutely aware of King Herod uh, cruelly giving orders that all babies up to a certain age be uh, um, killed. So there is a darkness about it. Um, a sort of foresight about what 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 is going to 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 come. So there's and this I, maternal maternal uh, tenderness mixed with sorrow. Um, in fact, you're absolutely right. And um, this is sort of the way he's written for the sopranos throughout the whole three movements of the piece is very much to do with maternal maternal instincts. Um, Yes, um, that's an interesting thought. I'd not thought about that. So this is, um, if you'd like me to play a little bit of it, um, I might play the whole, the movements around about five minutes long. Um, then let's, let's hear it in its entirety, yep. if we may. Yes, please. And I'll play this recording really, because it ties together. I tried to find some um, uh, link between the things that I was going to play tonight. So this is James McMillan, who did his degree at Edinburgh and went through the Music Society, as I did. He was taught by Kenneth Leighton, the professor at Edinburgh, and the recording you're about to hear is sung by the National Youth Choir of Scotland, which is an amazing, I'll maybe just talk about that for two or three um, seconds. Um, so I'm at university with a lovely um, chap, Christopher Bell, who's the artistic director now of the National Youth Choirs of Scotland. Um, originally for Bel Belfast, he was a chorister at Belfast Cathedral. A couple of years ahead of me at university, and inspired me because he conducted the chorus and the orchestra, um, like you do um, in Prague. He conducted that at Edinburgh. And um, I remember him saying during my undergraduate years in Edinburgh, oh, one day I'm going to start a National Youth Choir of Scotland because I think it would be great to get children singing. And um, goodness me, he has. It's been going about 20 years now. And um, every week there are various satellite groups of it in every town around Scotland. And um, every, well, not during lockdown, unfortunately. Although Alas, they, yes. They have over 3,000 young people a week singing in the National Youth Choir uh, in different towns. Um, and in the summer and in the Easter vacation, they run courses for, um, they get um, some of those choristers together and they produce a National Boys Choir, a National Girls Choir, the National Youth Choir, and a National Training Choir, which is a younger age group. So he's done very well. There's a lot of singing. We benefit from that at university because a lot of our choristers that come in now have been through the National Youth Choir. Ah, yes. So this is a recording they made with James Macmillan of Cantos Sagrados. Here's the third movement. Um, I'll share my screen first again. Thanks. Um, no, I'm getting the hang of it. I'm, I'm not as adept as you are. <laughs> uh, but here we go. Screen share. There we are. Is that good? And then I'm yes. just going to yes. roll.
there we are. That's a quite... superb piece, Ex extremely oh. moving, extremely moving. I have to confess that I, I was not aware of it. Uh, I was not aware of it at all. Um, well, uh, the next thing I should like to ask you about is, I know that you are uh, uh, someone who profoundly loves Bach's Mass in B minor, and I believe you've been involved in performances, you have even recorded the piece. I'm particularly keen to hear your thoughts um, uh, on this, on the interpretation of the piece, not least because the second of our sessions, which we had two weeks ago, was devoted to the interpretation or the possible interpretations, the history of interpretations and the scholarship behind those of Bach's Mass in B minor. Uh, we listened to excerpts uh, uh, from recordings by Hermann Scherchen and uh, Klemperer, who is one of my favorites. And Klemperer is a conductor on whom we shall have one whole session just devoted to his life and uh, work but also uh, we covered some more recent work, um, uh, not only the increasing uh, trend which already was happening in the, in the middle of the 20th century of using smaller forces than had been used in the 19th century for read-throughs of movements with uh, you know, 200 uh, singers uh, sitting together and singing the uh, Sanctus or, or the Credo or, or whatever it was but also increasing evidence, some of it rather compelling, uh, to indicate that uh, particularly for those movements where like the Hosanna, for example, where you've got a uh, divided choir, uh, Bach may well have had uh, not more than one singer per part. Now, of course, we can have all sorts of philosophical discussions as to whether or not we need necessarily emulate the circumstances that applied in Leipzig. But of course, I mentioned then that I heard on the BBC World Service at the time as a child uh, in Cyprus, um, uh, a little excerpt from the Joshua Rifkin uh, recording uh, of, 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 that, uh, of the first one voice per part performance and was quite uh, captivated by it at the time. Uh, and there were people who were at the time not convinced of his views. I believe that when he lectured for the American Musicological uh, Society, people walked out and he could not uh, complete the lecture. And there were people saying, oh, this chap claims that Bach's choir boys were ill and so he could perform the mass with only one singer per part, ha ha ha. But it later emerged that some of these arguments uh, belie a huge amount of spade work and scholarship and the arguments are far more nuanced than just claiming that some of the singers were ill so he had only one voice left. Um, my op opinion is that we should take delight in the plurality of various different ways of looking at such a masterpiece which is like a veritable diamond you can look at it from different directions and the light shines a little bit differently but i would like to hear uh, some of your own uh, something about your own experiences and uh, views and perhaps uh, savor a little bit of the recording that you made uh, not very long ago i believe do do tell us um, thank you. Yes. Well, um, you are the scholar, obviously, and you'll know much more about it than, than I do. But um, we're very fortunate. I suppose in the UK, there's been a very big swing towards what we might call authentic performance in the last 20 years. Um, and in Scotland, that's gaining some ground. Again, you, you know, um, over in the Czech Republic, you may not think of Scotland as being at the cutting edge of uh, musicology and all that sort of stuff and performance but uh, we have um, we've got a fantastic department in Glasgow University headed by John Butt who you'll probably know who's a well yes. art scholar yes, uh, yes. a phenomenal man um, many many years ago um, a lovely girl Susan Hamilton an Edinburgh girl um, she was actually the first ever female head chorister at Edinburgh Cathedral back in the 1980s um, she happens to be a good friend of mine as well. Um, she decided Scotland could do with 
having its own professional small group of singers. Scotland didn't have a Monteverdi choir or a 16 or anything of that sort. And she'd sung with the Monteverdis and the 16 and Herr Weger and, and all sorts of um, ensembles around Europe. Came back to Edinburgh and thought that it would be good if um, Scotland had that. So she started a, an ensemble called the Dunedin Consort um, with Ben Parry, who at that time was a swingle singer. Um, he's now the assistant director of music at King's College, mm -hmm. Cambridge. Um, so both singers and they started what was originally a vocal group, um, just uh, sometimes one singer apart, two singers, three singers. Um, and they um, got quite a reputation around Scotland performing in, I don't know whether you, you would have this in the Czech Republic, what we call music clubs in the UK. So for example, after you finished a conservatoire, or university and you're trying to establish yourself as a performer there's a network of subscription clubs around the uk um, that promote young performers um, and so they would go around the uh, music clubs of scotland um, doing their stuff and um, they started a collaboration with john butt who was the professor at glasgow and started doing things which involved singers and instrumentalists Yes. Um, and that gained more ground. Um, they did a lot of um, groundbreaking um, performances, you know, authentic instruments, originally using a lot of the people that played for the Monteverdis in London um, and that sort of in the orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. So a lot of these people would come up to Edinburgh, do a concert and then disappear again. Um, and as part of the journey of Dunedin Consort, um, they had a little gap of about 18 months between managements where I um, Susan asked me to come and manage it really from my kitchen table a long time ago. It's grown into a very professional organization now. Um, but during that time, we were recording the Bark B minor mass in the Rifkin edition. Um, and again, um, one, two, three people to a part, depending on the movement. Yes. Um, uh, beautifully uh, recorded in Greyfriars Kirk, in fact. Again, ah. Another. another <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yes, um, yes, and I, I don't know, I mean, I've got a lot of it here on um, Spotify. I was going to play you just a duet of Susan, as she's an Edinburgh girl, and in fact has taken some rehearsals of um, the University Music Society for me, a duet of her and Thomas Hobbes singing um, um, the Domine Deus, but if you'd mm -hmm. like instead a small chorus I, I don't know what you'd prefer well uh, I'll tell you what I'd prefer I'd, I'd like to hear the duet and if we can play on to hear Quitoli Speccata Mundi why don't we do that yes um, I'll just get that up here uh, again um, I was very very honoured to play organ continuo in all chamber organ continuo for the recordings yes. so you may not hear the organ it's somewhere in the background but um I am tootling away on the organ, as we would say. So I think, um, I'll just check first of all. Yes, right, fine. Let's just, I'll send it. So at least we've got something to look at. Thanks. Here we go.
Sorry, Hike, do you want the Cretolis as well, or is that enough? Sorry, I can't hear you, it might be me. Uh, I'd like a little bit of the Et Resurrexit, if we may, having, having buried Christ, let us witness his resurrection. Let's do that. that had me nearly dancing. Uh, 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 I should like to say two things as my reaction. One is that all too often, uh, as it were, performances that are described as being historically informed 
suffer from a certain lack of wholeheartedness, a certain lack of expressivity. Oh gosh, let's be careful, we mustn't use vibrato. Oh, the phrase, it mustn't be longer than two bars, otherwise it would be too romantic, uh, and that kind of thing. But what I heard now had gusto and was full-blooded and passionate and voices that were free and uh, vibrant. So I'm, uh, I'm actually uh, delighted by what I heard. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, when you mentioned the Dunedin uh, consort, I uh, sort of vague, faint light bulb lit at the back of my mind. Where had I heard them? Um, uh, two weeks ago, when I uh, made a, a small presentation uh, about the Bach Mass in B minor, I was able to recommend a volume by Professor Dan Melamed called Listening to Bach, uh, which is a discussion of the Mass in B minor and the Christmas Oratorio. And if you acquire that book, you gain access to a website where there are a lot of musical illustrations. And I believe the, performance there, the performers there are, in fact, the unity ensemble, including your good self and your colleagues. Amazing. <laughs> Yet another reason for people to acquire that book and gain access to the website and they can enjoy more. Uh, when did uh, this uh, CD set um, appear? It's, uh, this one was 2010 we recorded it, so it's quite, um, yeah. But um, it's such an amazing thing, Bach, isn't it? I mean, you will know from, you know, um, you obviously love Bach as well. and. Um, I don't know how you were brought up to think about it. I remember being brought up listening to um, a recording from years ago with um, the British composer uh, Rafe Vaughan Williams playing continuo on a grand piano with sort of Rachmaninoff style chords. It was beautiful, but yes, when I yes. how it was done, um, and I remember things like you know the opening of the St Matthew Passion with the repeated chorus taking forever to get through because it was so slow um yes yes of its own journey as well wasn't it um yeah <laughs> but um it's such a different world now that we've got all these as you say you know Klemper, uh, we've got all sorts of different sorts of performance of bach and there is something for everyone and it speaks to us all in different ways and it's the mark of the most amazing musicianship isn't it that it works at all these different tempi with all these different sizes of ensemble um, yes. In way, isn't it? Fantastic. And we are fortunate that we have access to all these different uh, approaches um, to suit the, the, the mood of the moment. Uh, you asked me about what sort of Bach I was brought up uh, on. When I was um, a child and becoming an adolescent, uh, when I first really started becoming interested in Bach, um, uh, it was a slightly schizophrenic existence. I had heard a proms performance off the radio of Andrew Parrott and the Taverner uh, players and Taverner singers, uh, a sort of dancing, transparent uh, uh, Bach that was different to anything that I'd heard up to that point, and I was quite enchanted by it. And yet, on the other hand, I was drawn by this much more uh, searching and perhaps even grim Approach. It's unfair to say it's Lemper's approach because Lemper himself was actually in his youth quite progressive and he used smaller forces than other had uh, behind him. But I would have sometimes morbid, morbid thoughts. Which version would I like to be played at my funeral? The cheerful dancing uh, um, um, uh, version that is transparent but uh, sort of in a jiffy it just floats and it disappears or this rather sort of um, uh, almost full of pain and, and uh, sort of gravitas possessing approach. And of course, we are the richer for it that we have access to all these different uh, ways of looking at it. And we have access to all this music because um, uh, there's somewhere or other Beethoven in a written, in a letter has written that he has heard of the Bach Mass in B minor and he has heard that it has a crucifixus movement with the ostinato that we just heard a moment ago. And he'd dearly love to get his hands on the music. 
but he couldn't. And we are so very spoiled for choice in that more so than any of our predecessors, we have access often at the touch of a mere button to all this um, heritage that, that, uh, that, that we can enjoy. Um, I, I enjoyed this, this Bach that you played very much indeed, I can say in all honesty. Um, but with the Dunedin consort, I believe you've recorded uh, some Gabriel Forêt as well. Um, would you care to mention something about that and perhaps favor us with a, with, with a rec recording uh, that demonstrates that as well? Our chorus not very long ago performed the Forêt Requiem. So a bit of Forêt will, will be just what... Well, similarly... I was trying to find some sort of theme for the excerpts I was going to play tonight, and of course, this is the Dunedin. This is the first recording we ever made. We, uh, I, I don't perform with them now, but in the very early days when it was starting up, I think this was about 1997, it was the very first recording. Right. Uh, and it's uh, two people to a part. And again, I, I chose this Contique. I, I happen to be playing the organ on it, that is not why I chose it. Um, we've done it a lot with the Music Society in Edinburgh, it's a piece they love. Um, in fact, I don't know if I'm correct. We came to Prague about two or three years ago on tour, and I think it's maybe one of the pieces we brought. I can't remember, but um, it's um, it's very different to the Bach, but it's the same sort of singers. Um, yes. Again, yes. The flavour of just a couple of people to a part. So here's the Conti de Jean Racine, um, the Needing Consort. Here we go. I'll share again. I don't need to share particularly, but um, in fact, there's nothing to see. I maybe won't share. Maybe I will. Thanks.
I enjoyed that. Uh, and, and I'm uh, especially appreciative of, of, of the way in which they're using the French language, which again is something that one can't take for granted when they sing Espérance and Silence, these so-called mute uh, vowels all too often are endowed with an involuntary ugly accent. None of that here. There's, there's great attention to the text, which, which in Foray and Debussy and those French uh, songwriters go hand in hand with each other. And if you violate one, you violate the other. And, and if you respect one, uh, it, 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 it very much uh, benefits the other as well. So that was absolutely superb. And it was nice also, unlike the Bach examples, where in the, uh, you know, with all those trumpets in the at Resurrexit, one doesn't hear all that much continuo, we were able to enjoy a little bit of your uh, organ playing. Um, <laughs> what, was that also recorded in at Great uh, Greyfriars? No, uh, it wasn't. It was recorded in um, a boarding school just outside Edinburgh called Loretto School. And going back to the comment earlier when I was explaining about um, there was a real growth in organ building in Edinburgh in the 1980s. I don't know where this came from, but there were half a dozen, maybe eight new organs built, all sort of Baroque copies or, or late Baroque classical instruments. Right. Loretto had an organ built. It's a fantastic instrument um, that's a sort of um, late Baroque, early classical instrument. Right. And we have a lovely chapel, um, so we, we recorded it there. Um, and for, for very practical reasons, it's a long way from a road as well. So yes, a lot of noise, as you will know. But um, yeah, I think also going back to your comments about language, don't you find now, Hank, that we're much more concerned about delivering the text in a choral piece? Um, much more, I think, in the last 10 years or so than we were 20, 30 years ago. I think, uh, certainly in the areas I've worked, it's much more about delivering the text through the music rather than learning the notes and deciding where the T's and D's and punctuation's going to go. But the text has to be very vibrant. That, that's the first thing. And in fact, it's very interesting working with John Butt because he comes from a textual point of view always thinking that Bach had the text in his head, obviously, and was setting the text. And um, he has a great thing, he says, um, uh, there are two ways of singing. Um, when the counterpoint first starts and you are the point of imitation, you're, you're a voice. But as soon as someone else comes in, you are then an instrument and you have to disappear into the instrumental um, texture of the orchestra. Um, and he gets some amazing sounds and balances mm. by the singers to do that. It's fantastic. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to see at a rehearsal. Um, anyway. That's I, I, think I, I think I agree with you. And, uh, and it surely must be, as you say, in other words, the text should be the starting point. And that is also very much something that I'm sure you will agree with from your uh, work as a man of the theatre, because with an opera, if you're going to conduct an opera or, or help singers, coach singers with an opera, you start with a libretto even before you start working with the score. And that brings me uh, to, uh, to opera, because I believe that you have um, uh, something from your work in, in that area also prepared uh, for us. This isn't, uh, my first job was at Scottish Opera as a repetiteur for a few years. and. Um, this isn't a, a recording of Scottish operas, but I just thought it would be interesting. Um, I always think it's interesting how, in a secular kind of environment, composers have woven religious text into what they've done. And here's a re I think this is an amazing bit of Tosca. This is Pacini's Tosca. It's the end of Act One, I'm sure you know it, the big church scene uh, where we await the Cardinal's entrance. Um, and we've got the um, cathedral choir as such, singing the mm -hmm. Te at the end with the usual theatrics of, uh, of Puccini. You've got the canon yes. going in Castel Sant'Angelo and all that sort of thing. But uh, I just thought it would be interesting um, for us to have that as a little difference. Um, By all means, yes, yeah. let's. YouTube clip of it. I don't know how well the YouTube fares. The sound seems to be okay. I think I'll just do the YouTube rather than the... Shall I try that and see? 
uh, yeah, what might happen is the sound is likely to be okay one way or the other, but with YouTube, the image, uh, if, if it happens to be a video, the image will be rather jagged. But uh, it's it's a sound that we're... we're, we're, we're I just thought, rather than having a blank screen at this end. Uh, <laughs> yes. The Teatro dell'Opera di Roma, um, and it's, uh, I don't know who's conducting this. Um, no, I don't. I'm ever so sorry. Oh, I do. Um, it's Donato Renzetti, who I do not know. Nor do I. But it's um, it j just give you a little bit of a flavour of some opera. Excellent. Spiri una carrozza, presto, seguila dovunque vada, non visto, provvedi, a bene il convegno, palazzo Farnese.
wonderful, wonderful. Well, Neil, this has been splendid sharing these experiences and these various uh, musical jewels uh, with us. Um, we still have a little bit of time, so I should first like to ask if uh, uh, if there's uh, any of our listeners who might perhaps wish to ask you uh, something. Um, and uh, I, I'm looking for the chat window. If there's anyone who feels shy about uh, rendering themselves visible and orally posing a question, they might choose perhaps the, this other means of typing a question via chat or, uh, or uh, unmuting themselves and, uh, and asking our distinguished guest any thoughts that may have arisen from what he said and the uh, musical excerpts that he chose. We have spanned a very wide period and a lot of different styles and musical idioms, a lot of riches, um, a lot of things to explore over the coming days. Um, I usually place those sessions on YouTube afterwards, but it is very, very probable that due to copyright reasons, we shall have to remove some of the musical excerpts, but that doesn't matter because someone can listen to the chat that we had and be motivated to explore further and uh, borrow CDs from their local library or, or buy some of the music perhaps. So that's, that's, that's our uh, purpose. So I, I don't see anything in the chat window as yet. Um, is there anyone who might like to ask something? Please don't be shy. I shall go into gallery view. I, I say actually, whilst we're all here, um, what a privilege it's been to talk to you all this evening. Um, it's always absolutely delightful and slightly frightening to see Hike at the bottom of my um, rehearsal room. <laughs> Why <But> frightening? <laughs> always manages to say something very positive at the end, even though we did the Brahms Requiem in, I think, 52 minutes or something. Um, <laughs> the last performance you heard, it was a very fast performance. But um, it's always like, and we're a very welcoming chorus. Um, we rehearse, uh, you'll f if you're ever in Edinburgh is what I'm trying to say, once this terrible pandemic is over, if you are in Ed ever in Edinburgh and you fancy coming to sing for an hour or two, we rehearse on a Tuesday evening, you could probably find us, well you will, on the university website, you would be more than welcome, any of you, just to pop into a rehearsal and say hello, um, or come and sing for the evening, or come and sing for half the evening, or pop in for 15 minutes. Um, we're very welcoming in that sense. It's um, it's a very open, collegiate kind of atmosphere, um, and we'd be delighted to see you. Um, That's a very generous invitation, and I would second it by saying that if you do happen to be Edinburgh, do uh, do not miss the opportunity of coming along and and attending the uh, rehearsal. Perhaps as an auditor, uh, you may be able to borrow the music at the entrance. I think. But these are very, very inspiring, very, very upbeat occasions that uh, certainly on those occasions when I've been able to uh, pop in in my discreet way, which little did I realize that it was so threatening uh, or frightening, uh, but I, I, I found it a marvelous way of recharging my, uh, my uh, batteries. Uh, so it's, it's uh, warmly uh, recommended. It's always lovely to see you there. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, uh, let me say that it would be nice one day to welcome you in Prague. I know you mentioned that apparently you were there three years ago. Uh, sadly, we, we were unaware of, of it and missed it all. But um, I take comfort in the knowledge that, at least in my experience, people who visit Prague tend to do so again. There is yes. something about the city that tends to draw people to it again. So having once tasted of the fruit, as it were, people wish to take another bite if possible. Uh, it too is a lovely city and it too is a very friendly and welcoming place. So uh, perhaps one day, uh, uh, you know, Neil and the uh, Edinburgh University uh, Music Society Chorus or one or other of these other splendid groups with whom you work might indeed 
uh, visit us and grace the city with their uh, music making. Now, we see that we have a, a question uh, from uh, Thomas Bazika, uh, who runs a very fine website called the Prague Music Connection and works for Czech Radio. Good to see you, Thomas. Uh, may I uh, see your, or, or, or hear your question? Excellent. Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Uh, oh, wonderful. Well, I was wondering if I might have um, a question for our guest, and I, I wanted to, you know, uh, say that I very much enjoyed this uh, you know, musical journey of uh, of this evening, and and I very much appreciate it. But I was I was intrigued by the mention of the uh, Dunedin consort of uh, John Butt, and um, because I very much enjoy their recordings, and I was wondering uh, if Neil perhaps has been part of uh, some of the other recordings. Uh, I think they've done a reconstruction of the first performance of uh, Mozart's Requiem and also reconstruction of uh, Bach's Passion Liturgy of the St. John Passion. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, maybe uh, uh, if you could speak a little bit to, to those recordings or maybe re recommend other recordings. Thomas, thank you for asking. Um, I haven't been um, part of the other recordings. I did the very first recording and I was in the B minor mass recording. Um, I organized one or two of the other little um, things that they've done, but um, our paths have kind of gone that way a bit. But um, a, a lot of uh, my colleagues work um, uh, with Dunedin. Um, they're certainly a force of nature in the UK. They're doing so well. Um, all their recordings, for, for your other um, listeners and watchers, all the recordings are what we'd call historical um, recreations. Um, and John Butt's very much gone for... Um, um, a decision to make recordings of particular editions or performances that have never been done before, um, as you'll probably know. So um, the Canon's version of, um, uh, oh, let me think. I've, I've lost the, my, my thread of thought now, but they're, they're all historically recreated recordings of the, as they would have been performed at certain times um, with the documentary evidence that we have for those, record, uh, for those performances. So um, they're, they're certainly worth um, chasing up. And they've got now a catalogue of maybe, maybe 20 different recordings, St. John Passion, St. Matthew Passion, um, lots of the big bark, um, the handle, lots of handle, um, Canon's version of, um, of of Messiah, yes. Um, so yeah, they're worth very much worth looking into, and they're performing around Europe quite a lot at the moment. Well, obviously not under these conditions, but um, you might find them actually um, in Prague at some point. They they certainly do a lot of the music festivals around Europe. Sorry, that's a long-winded answer again, but um, thank you for the question. No, th thank you very much, and and maybe uh, just a, a small follow-up question, if I may. Uh, would you perhaps, uh, or could you perhaps uh, recommend uh, uh, for, you know, for us uh, a recording that uh, you may or may not have been part of that, um, not necessarily by the Dunedin consort, uh, that, uh, you know, you, you would think that our listeners might benefit uh, from, or maybe a recent favorite recording, or? I'll certainly do that. Um, um, well, uh, of course, my heart is with these people that are um, um, doing wonderful work in Scotland. So Dunedin consorts very much um, in my heart and I'm just looking um, on my, in fact, I'll share my screen for a second. If that's Thank you. Um, I don't know if you, any, any of you subscribe to Spotify, mm -hmm. but um, on Spotify, they've got um, Handel Samson, um, Ode for St. Cedar's Day, the Monte Verde Vespers, the Christmas Oratorio. Um, they've got some instrumental music now, the Bach Violin Concerto, I don't know if you can see that. Um, I think what I would probably recommend, um, if you're really looking for something, the St. John and St. Matthew Passions are outstanding recording. And they also won um, quite a lot of accolades, gramophone um, uh, magazine and that sort of thing. Uh, the the St. John or the St. Matthew are both phenomenal recordings. Um, that I think those are the two that I would go for, uh, possibly actually the St. Matthew. Wow, wonderful. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'll put that link in the chat box um, if I can find out how to do that. 
Okay. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Neil, I think you, you need to go to the bottom of your screen right. to find the chat screen. Right, let's do that. And let's just put a link here. Sorry to do this. That's right. In the meantime, if I may engage in a bit of advertisement, um, we have a session on interpreting Monteverdi's Vespro della Beata Vergine of 1610 on the 2nd of December, to which all are welcome. That's not this coming week, the week after. This coming week, uh, we shall have my good friend uh, Michael Ostriga, the director of music of Cologne University, uh, as my uh, guest. And the week after the Monteverdi Vespers, uh, we shall have a similar evening of words and music with the pianist uh, Bella Hartmann. Whilst the very last session of this semester on the 16th of December will be devoted to the life and work of the conductor uh, Otto Klemper. Well, he thought of himself as a conductor and a composer, but his legacy as a conductor has, uh, it, it seems for the moment at least, uh, very much overtaken uh, his reputation as a composer. So um, do bear in mind that these sessions will, will be open. The Zoom link that uh, you already have that has enabled you to connect uh, for this session is a recurring Zoom link and it's equally applicable for those other sessions. And if you would like to uh, follow some of the presentations that we've had in previous weeks, I've placed them on my own channel uh, on YouTube. So you can look up Haig, Eutigen, and you can find it there. Oh, splendid. We have the, those links from Neil uh, to the uh, Dunedin uh, consort. Uh, excellent. Uh, well, any other questions or comments? <laughs> Hello. Hello. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Neil, for sharing all the beautiful pieces of music. It was Absolutely lovely to see you and hear you again. <laughs> and thank you for singing in the chorus in Edinburgh. Um, some of you will know that Martina has been in Edinburgh for some time over the last couple of years and has sung in the chorus and um, it's been a joy to have you. Um, I think very secretly once we talked about maybe collaborating with your chorus, but who knows, that may happen in the future. I don't know. That would be lovely. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Microphone. <laughs> right. Martina not only sang in the Charles University chorus for uh, quite a few years, but she was its manager and under her regime, the chorus grew and improved very considerably. Uh, but the chorus has, we hope, temporarily lost her to Edinburgh. Um, as it were, but uh, so so our loss is your gain. Uh, it certainly is, yes. <laughs> well, uh, I see that there's uh, ah yes another uh, YouTube link from Neil. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, uh, one last uh, plea: if anyone has a question for Neil, please don't be shy. Okay, and if we have uh, exhausted on our possibilities at the moment, uh, allow me on behalf of us all, and particularly in the name of the Chorus and Orchestra of Charles University in Prague and my own, to express my very sincere uh, gratitude and appreciation to Neil, who, um, as you can imagine, is an exceedingly busy chap involved in all sorts of creative projects, but he very kindly set aside two hours of his time to come and uh, inspire us with his music, with his personality. And uh, I very much hope that before very long, we shall all be able to make music live and in the flesh uh, together. And in the meantime, though, evenings such as this one are uh, very nurturing, very heartwarming and very inspiring. So 
thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. It's been a lovely evening and a, a real honour to be a part of what you're doing. So I hope you have a great success with the next few evenings that you've got. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, all of you for, for attending, uh, particularly our students who, having spent already most of the day behind their computer screen for lectures and things, for people who are working, uh, having chosen to spend uh, another two hours uh, so that we can all be together and share in these beautiful things, uh, I'm most grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Have an excellent week, be well, and don't hesitate to, to explore some of these marvelous musical leads that uh, Neil has kindly presented to us. Thank you very much. A very good night to you.